Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Department of Green. We're in now in the afternoon session, and we've got some absolutely incredible speakers lined up for you. Indra is a co-initiator of the Alternative UK, which you heard, those of you in the workshop, you heard Pat talk about earlier as well. And we're really, really excited to welcome Indra today, um, as she'll be talking about dreaming the soft power. You'll hear for about half an hour from Indra, and then there'll be a chance for a Q&A and a little bit of an in-conversation with. Um, so on that note, absolutely uh, so honoured and excited to, to welcome Indra. She's a complete force for power and of power. And when you hear us speak, you'll understand why. Um, welcome, Indra. <laughs> Thanks so much, Imi. And um, hello, everyone. I can't see you, but uh, I'm imagining you out there. Um, and I really want to encourage uh, you to go along with me. This is almost a bit of an experiment. It's not the usual uh, introduction to the Alternative UK that I would give, but the invitation to think about the dreaming aspect of everything that we're trying to do um, really, you know, suggested that we should focus on this for a moment and do it together with you. So who am I? I mean, usually I would answer this question very simply. I'd like you to know why I'm here and why on earth I've got any credentials to talk to you about this. But right from the start of this, uh, I'd like to encourage you to think about the question, who am I? So if I was simply to describe you in terms of my career, that would be the external journey. You know, the thing I'm putting on the stage, the thing I think you want to know about me. And then there's the internal journey, the, the real, you know, story that I'm telling about myself all the time that I might share with you if we were being uh, intimate or we had the time to notice each other and how we were um, reacting, you know, a different kind of story, but it's one that we carry around with us all the time. And then I'd like to introduce a third idea, this eternal observing story that's going on in our head the whole time. If you haven't ever considered what that might be, I'd invite you to do that either now or to think about it um, after this presentation and to consider that this external journey, the internal journey, and the sort of eternal journey is going on all the time. We're telling ourselves a number of different stories and which one of those really is the reality that we should be entertaining when we think about what kind of a new politics do we need, for example. So this in itself uh, is a story of two stories and I didn't know what kind of an audience I would have today um, and I didn't uh, choose until this minute which story I would tell you to start this whole journey off. And I'm going to go with uh, the story of uh, a story that many of you may be familiar with um, uh, uh, around Jung. One of, uh, one of uh, Jung's patients was a young woman, very educated and intelligent, who seemed to feel she knew more than anyone else, including her therapist. This proved problematic, obviously, because Jung couldn't get through to her, even after multiple sessions. Finally, he realized that the woman would never listen to him or solve her problems unless something highly unusual shook her world enough to dislodge her sense of superiority. What that might be, he had no idea. During their session together in Jung's office, he sat opposite the woman with his back to a wind with his back to a window. As usual, she rattled on, this time about a dream she had the night before. She told Jung that in the dream, someone gave her a gold scarab beetle. Now, while the woman was speaking, Jung kept hearing something hitting the window behind him. The sound continued even after the woman stopped talking. So Jung turned around to look. What he saw was a large bug. It kept bumping the window as if trying to get in. Jung thought, this is strange. He got up, walked to the window and opened it. Somehow he caught the bug and then recognized it as a type of scarab beetle. Realizing he might have something unusual enough to truly grab the woman's attention, he bore her the beetle and said, here is your scarab from her dream. 
After that event, as Jung predicted, the woman became an excellent patient and worked on her problems. And in his writings, Jung uses this story all the time as a perfect example of how synchronistic events can emerge from the paranormal world and impact people's lives. Now, why did I tell you that story? I mean, partly it's to do with the three stories that I was evoking at the beginning. One is a story that we see, that we feel needs to be heard. One is a story that is operating all the time internally. And then thirdly, there's a story which seems to break the wall. Um, we're not sure if we're in a story that we're making up or we're in another story. We seem to be within a dream within a dream. Let's hold that possibility for now and move on to the next slide. So here's a collection of words I'd like you just to dwell on for a second. Um, when we started the project of the Alternative UK, we asked ourselves, what is the human being that is constantly held at the heart of our politics? And I think the word that most of us would recognize is uh, homo economicus, that we're mostly a material human being living in an objectively material world. What we wanted to really express and capture at the heart of a new politics is this idea that we are bio social, spiritual entities. We're complex. There's a lot going on in our minds, but also the reality that we're experiencing all the time is fast changing and fast moving. How can we have a politics that serves the bio psychosocial, spiritual, entity that is a human being. I'm just inviting you to think about those words for a minute and see whether or not you can experience them yourself as true for you. So this is a slide that you might find more um, recognizable. When we're not thinking about ourselves as material human beings, we start to think about ourselves as emotional human beings. But what are our emotions? This slide um, invites you to think about emotions, not simply as reactions to things, but as the messengers that come from us physical material bodies to our minds to help us think about our needs. In fact, it's the work of the emotions that help us to link the internal dream to the external reality. You think now about these nine, what human given, what my uh, psychotherapy practice describes as the human givens, the given emotional needs that we're always trying to get met. Our need for attention, our need for status, our need for belonging, our need for autonomy and security our need for achievement, our need for privacy, our need for meaning and purpose, our need for intimacy. Ultimately, these things are constantly driving us, helping us to be material, materially flourishing through our, 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 our ability to work within the context and within the environment in which we can get these needs met. If you think about these emotional needs, there are material drives, but the way that we're going to be trying to get them met constantly is through the reality as it appears to us. So alongside our given emotional needs, we have these given capacities to get our needs met. So think again about your own complex memory your ability to have rapport and empathy, the power of your imagination, which we're going to go into a little bit more in a minute, the rational mind, which helps you to uh, create logic and to separate one thing from another, our ability to know, again, absolutely something we take for granted, to, you know, to be able to know something, our ability to, um, 
observe the self. That was the third part or the third story that I was describing to you before. And then we have the, 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 the one capacity that I want to um, dwell on a little more, the capacity of the dreaming brain. Now, all um, seven of these capacities that are described there um, are what make us as humans capable of living lives, of uh, the lives that can get the emotional needs met that I described in the earlier slide. We have these capacities. The question is whether or not we can create the conditions in which those capacities can be well used. But let's focus just for a minute now on the dreaming brain and how that works for us, but also how we have to learn to manage our dreaming brain. So the dreaming brain, which as I said before, is only one of our capacities, has um, innumerable functions. But there's three that I'd like to just um, draw your attention to today. The first one, um, which uh, is charmingly described as the uh, you, uh, described as the flushing toilet, um, this is this is the way that our our mind is able to process our emotions overnight. So, if in the course of a day, uh, some emotions trigger you or cause you to uh, to spike in some way or to overreact and you're not able to process those emotions in the course of the day. What happens at night is our brain borrows from all sorts of uh, images and metaphors that are lurking in our brain and turn them into a coherent narrative. So the narrative that you wake up with as a dream has done the job of processing the emotions that you weren't able to cope with during the day. This is a very important function of the dreaming brain because if you weren't able to do that at night, then your body actually uh, overheats and starts to um, work too hard. If you're not able to uh, do the job of processing overnight, uh, you might find yourself waking up early in the morning, unable to sleep properly. And when, th when this becomes too much of a, a, re a repeated habit, um, you, you know, it's very easy to fall into depression. So the job of flushing through your emotions at night is one of the very important aspects of the dreaming brain. Another thing, another aspect that I would, uh, want us to talk about today is how our dreaming brain can bring us into a trance in order to learn from each other. So for example, if you're paying attention to what I'm saying now, um, even if you're paying a little bit of attention, I have you in a bit of a trance. While you're in that trance, you're going to be absorbing and learning from what I'm saying. Without the ability to move into that relationship with attention, it's very difficult to do the learning, which then makes, it, makes us able to become knowing people. And then the third aspect, which is one that we're talking, I think we've been talking about and we'll be talking about over all of these three days is the power of the imagination. So with this part of your brain, the ability to um, go beyond what's materially in front of you and to conjure up different uh, scenarios, um, different possibilities, to be able to hold more than one image at a time, which was what I was talking about on the first slide, uh, is very much a function of our brain. It, can, it has two possibilities all the time. It can take us to a better place, uh, one that we yearn for or long for, but it can also take us to a much more dangerous place, one that we're afraid of, one that we catastrophize, one that causes us to react and to walk away. So the imagination, uh, of course, you've all experienced that, is at once something to welcome and to to enjoy, but it's also something to be wary of. At the same time as we're imagining better places, we could be imagining much worse places too. Um, there's there's a, a clear sort of sense that what we have, our socioeconomic political system that we have isn't right for us. And we need to somehow move on to another idea of the self, another idea of what's possible, um, and there's a great welcoming uh, of the idea that we can build a new narrative. 
we can create a new vision. Um, and there's an invitation to everyone to come and do that together. Uh, and in a lot of our um, events, when we're inviting people to do that, um, we're really uh, evoking this, this dreaming and yearning. Um, and we try not to, uh, you know, to, to pay too much attention at the beginning to what Antoine de Saint-Exupéry would call the boat, you know, we'd, we'd, we don't think about the boat too much. We think about the sea, what it is that the boat would be for. So we don't really think about how we structure our politics uh, and what the new structures are going to be. We think much more about why and what is it that we're yearning for and what is it that we need. In my experience, uh, what I spent a lot of my uh, career doing is really observing the dream machine uh, that everybody else is also trying to generate and spends billions of pounds doing so. So you've all heard of the American dream. And here's two more for you, the Great British dream or the Chinese dream. There's a lot of uh, concentrated um, investment in creating the dream uh, from the point of view of the people who have the power that is constantly, we're constantly being invited into this bigger dream. So even as we are creating a dream, quite often we're creating a dream within a dream. And to be aware of the competing dreams and the industry, if you like, or the market of competing dreams is quite important when we think about what kind of a new story can we tell or should we be able to tell. Again, going back to that early slide, the external story, the internal story, the eternal story. There's also the personal story, the social story, the shared global story. Which story of us are we occupying? And how are we occupying it? And within that paradigm or that narrative of we are building dreams, there's now, the also, there's now also this idea that we can wake up from a dream. So very important in our public space, we've been experiencing together Extinction and Rebellion, who've been waking us up, if you like, to the reality of our environmental dangers that we're in. Over this past couple of weeks, we've woken up again to the truth that Black Lives Matter. These, um, these new stories that interrupt our um, ongoing dreams are all incredibly important for us to sense that we are in a dream that we might have given into and we need to wake up to this new reality. But what is it that we're waking up to? Is it possible for us to actually wake up? This is something we have to ask ourselves as we're pursuing our dreams. So how do we own and hold and craft the dream within the dream? At this very minute, so I've used that uh, image there of Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat, uh, which I th and I think the song was, any dream will do. That's a danger, right? It's not true that any dream will do. At the moment, as we're speaking, there's a picture there of Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum very conscious that they need to be in charge of whatever the new dream will be. Now, I'm not saying that the World Economic Forum won't have the best of intentions there, but how will we be able to know if it's not simply business as usual with the same corporations and the same kind of power and the same kind of elites who are going to be uh, inviting us to create a new dream? What is possible for us now in this world of dreams that we're uh, collectively invoking? So there is a danger that if we simply give in to the dream of our yearning and belonging, that we'll find ourselves in this permanent trance. On the left, there's a picture of people lining up uh, just a couple of days ago, I think, outside Primark, still somehow convinced that buying stuff 
is somehow the route to their flourishing. This is, uh, this is a dream that has been manufactured over decades by the advertising industry who have been able to, through very detailed and careful understanding of the psychological, um, emotional needs that I described, have been able to sell into our emotional needs the idea that certain, um, such certain consumer goods are going to deliver us those dreams. So buying a handbag will get a status or buying a drink will give us belonging. Those cues there are signs that people are still somehow in the dream that buying, that buying and consuming are going to give them the meaning and belonging that they're yearning for. On the other hand, there's also the danger that by escaping or trying to constantly escape that uh, set of dreams, uh, that will get lost forever in an infinite possibility of something being better, but not ever really addressing the crises that we're facing that are material crises. So um, I hope that's been some sort of a, you know, we're coming to the end of, our, of, of, of my presentation actually, um, because of what I really wanted to do was to bring you to the beginning point which is where the Alternative UK uh, and why the Alternative UK was founded. Our sense was that before we can create a new political movement or a new political uh, platform or a new political story, we have to first understand how we created our earlier ones, how we um, are, are in a sense are still uh, operating within old dreams and how trying to move away from those dreams uh, could, could still, uh, unless we're uh, able to curate the spaces and curate the events and create the kind of uh, communities of owning and shaping those dreams together, that we could still be lost in the many dreams that are being manufactured and created for us. So what we do at the uh, Alternative UK is three things. The first thing is uh, we, we uh, produce every, uh, every week um, a daily and weekly alternative. That is, um, we're inviting people to always consciously step outside of the bubble uh, of the, you know, the, the mainstream discourse and look for the evidence that there are solutions available to us. It's a conscious act. So um, only 2% of people are members of political parties. That 2% creates the discourse that is our mainstream political discourse. In order to find a new one, we have to consciously step outside of that and look for what is being talked about, what is being explored and what is possible outside of that bubble. So that's our daily alternative. The second thing we do is we open what we call citizens action networks in communities around the country. When we do that, we bring people together, we build relationship and trust between them and we invite them to think about the future and to begin the act of curating the possible dream for the community in which you're living. So the yearning, the imagining of the future, the answering the needs for flourishing, they happen in person between people as they're building bonds of trust and building relationship. In that way, the, you know, the dreaming brain is always reconnected to the material um, reality as you're experiencing it between you. But, and then the third thing we do, which is uh, described there as shape the system, is that we bring people who are actively um, trying to give rise to a new system, the kind of system that 
exists outside of the current system. We're trying to bring those people together and drive collaboration uh, and co-creation between them. So uh, all the time we are operating in the idea that we need to understand the narrative and the dream that we're already existing within through the act of making relationship with each other we are grounding our own reality and then drawing and uh, creating a new dream from that place so um, I hope that this rather you know um, quick ride through the idea of what it means to be a personal dreaming person all the way through to what is a political platform um, hasn't been too confusing or too dreamlike um, but I'd really uh, like to invite your questions on any aspect of this uh, but also um, regarding uh, what a new politics could be and how we can ground it with dreaming in a reality. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Indra. Um, I'm always um, excited to hear from you, and you always open up new, new things for me. We've already got some questions coming in, so to say to the audience, you know, please share your questions. Um, but before we do that, I, I've got a few to, to ask myself and a couple in the chat. Um, but I wanted to just pick up on a theme that's come through today already um, this idea of yearning and this longing and and how important that is um, to create when you're trying to create the future we need to yearn and long for something so I was wondering before I go on to some questions um, could you go into that a little bit deeper and tell us you know your thoughts on that yeah I mean um, as I said when I when I first thought about uh creating a different, a new political platform. Uh, and I had to ask myself, what is it that, uh, wh what is the narrative uh, of the 2%? And then one of the most important parts of it is living within a sort of world of scarcity uh, and living with the idea that we are powerless uh, to really change certain kinds of, uh, uh, you know, truths about, uh, you know, about our economy or about our material abundance or, you know, the story of our, um, you know, the, the story that we need, for example, to be on these hamster wheels, constantly generating a certain kind of wealth in order to get a certain kind of outcome. Um, I feel as trapped, we're, we're trapped in that story. But underneath it all, there's always this yearning for something quite different. And for a lot of people, that results in uh, moving out of the, you know, out of the thing that's on offer. So, you know, deciding not to take a job or deciding not to, uh, you know, live within a certain uh, story of our powerlessness. Uh, it's like a private, it's a private sense of, uh, of what is possible and what we're really capable of. Um, we find ourselves yearning for that all the time underneath our daily realities. And yet still at the same time, you know, most of us are prepared to be on that hamster wheel, to buy into the system, to believe that the growth economy is necessary and the only way that we're going to be able to uh, hold all of this together. There's a sort of buying into something at the same time as there is a sort of sense that it could really be something different. Uh, and wanting something different for ourselves and for our children and so on. Uh, and these two things always sit alongside each other. And so at some point, you have to give license to the yearning and to the longing, because unless you really fully occupy that, um, you can't step away from what you've, you know, what part of you has decided and given into uh, is the truth or the, or, the, or the necessary reality for our survival. And, and it leads in quite uh, beautifully to a question, so I'll, I'll bring this one in now um, in from the audience from Kat Drew. Um, she said that she'd like to ask you about different ways to prompt communities to almost stand outside of themselves and look in at the dream they are in. And I think I'd also sort of back that up with um, a frame that you added today that I haven't thought about is that moment where 
because I often associate dreams with this beautiful, lovely utopia. But when you talked about the fact that actually, how do we wake up from the dream that we're in, whether that's been manufactured or we've created it or a, or a cycle of that, you know, the fact that so many of us walk around every day oblivious to all the things that are coming around the corner or what are happening to other uh, other people and other things this is this is a dream we've created for ourselves uh, and waking up from that so I, I feel like this this question is linked to to that point because that was a really nice frame for me so yeah as Kat said um, you know how do we how do we or what advice do you have for how we kind of um, uh, stand outside get communities to stand outside themselves and look look at this dream look at this world that is that has been created mm. i mean i think mostly our dreams can uh, persist unless we really challenge them so for example if we walk around in our community uh we might look at the people in the street we might look at the people in the shop we might uh, go home and think about uh, the fact that we've just been outside. And in us, in our minds, we'll be telling stories about what we've seen. You know, we we might, our eyes might have, ca you know, cast, we, we, we might have glanced at a, p a group of young people on the street. You know, we might have glanced at uh, somebody struggling with a shopping basket. We might have walked past a Starbucks. All the time, we're telling ourselves stories about what we're looking at. Right? And those stories are mostly the thing that you were just describing. They're buying into a bigger uh, idea of who we are collectively. That's the story of us, and we're buying into it all the time. Um, the, way to, the way to cut through that is to, is to move into relationship with each other. So when we uh, hold our... It's a process that we... Um, that we have called a collaboratory, um, whereby we bring people from uh, all across the community as broad a, and diverse a selection of people as we can find, uh, and we uh, invite them to meet each other. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to c close my mail, which is making so much noise. And we invite them to meet each other, and it's a carefully curated and facilitated space which allows uh, the people who are meeting each other, first of all, to be heard, to be able to hear each other and slowly move into, into larger groups until there's a sense in the room that people are being heard before we move into bigger questions. And that process of moving into relationship with the people that you actually live uh, with, in, you know, that you only see in the streets, it's often quite shocking for people because the person that they'd made some story about in their head is not really the person that they're now meeting. And that's, it's not a simple thing of, um, oh, I thought you were, you know, I imagined that you were like this. It's something far deeper than that. It's, it's like if you, if you spend a, any amount of time with a person, a whole world opens up in front of you. It's the world of that person's life. You know, it's, 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 it's enormous and you can get lost you know, I don't know how many have ever had that experience of really listening to somebody else, slowly being drawn into that person's world and being lost there, you know, feeling their life as they are, there, as they are themselves telling it to you. This is what's, lo this is what's lost to us um, in, our, in our world where we just rush past each other. We're kind of utilizing each other. We're telling stories about ourselves, about each other. Um, it's very difficult, really, to be able to imagine change if you're the one who's constantly telling the story about your community. But when communities start to move into relationship like that, suddenly something very, very different is possible. That's, um, that's very fascinating in, in uh, the current context. So I'm going to follow up with my own uh, question to that. Um, in, in many ways, we're, we're obviously seeing a, a huge resurgence of people moving into community in relationship with one another in lots of creative incredible ways but we're also seeing large swathes of the population actually not even having their normal daily interactions or I noticed myself last week that um, when I was feeling really down with everything that was happening that 
one of the things I needed to do was just walk on my high street because I live on a high street and just look at people in the whites of the eyes and, and mm. not just read this narrative on the internet about what's coming and what's happening. And um, and I realised um, perhaps how much I've been able to curate who I talk to, what sessions I go to, mm. what things I want to do, what talks I listen to, because it's all in my... It's like my very own personally curated life now because I don't have to do all the things that would be, you know, picking up the shopping or, you know, popping over to my mum and dad's. Like all these things are just gone, right? And I think it, everything's in my choice. I'm interested mm. in that in myself, but at a, a broader scale. Um, what do you think, um, apart from the good stuff, and I, I've seen so much of the good stuff you've shared to the alternative, what do you think is happening about us being in relationship with each other when we are physically distanced and we're not hearing those whole stories. So we're potentially building stories of the world and of each other and of our intentions. Uh, you know, what are you seeing, sensing, hearing? I do find this a very extraordinary time. I've never experienced anything quite like this before, which is like saying something. Um, and, I, and again, I think it's a multiple arena storytelling that's going on. So on the one hand, yeah, we are separate from each other and we're very present suddenly to the stories that are being told to us about other people. Um, and I've never seen as much of a shift actually uh, in the um, mainstream discussion of, of what is right and what is wrong. You know, for example, in, 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 um, in the UK, um, there's been a real shift in the idea of where is, where is the authority you know, this has happened very fast, right? So if you think about only a couple of months ago, we had a government that was riding high um, in terms of, uh, you know, huge amount of approval from the people. This was now the authority we were going to be listening to this. Over a very short amount of time, we've lost that authority almost entirely. And people are lacking authority um, and having to make, um, you know, or be seeking actively for new sources of authority, which they're finding sometimes from their own, uh, you know, seeking, but also um, from each other. So new uh, sources like, for example, an, uh, a COVID neighborhood network has become the thing to trust, uh, to be able to reach out to and to be able to um, expect empathy and understanding from, you know, so uh, these sorts of phenomena are happening. But I, I want to make a case as well for what's happening on Zoom, because a lot of people, I hear a lot of people saying that uh, it's not real, the kind of relationships that you can have um, uh, fr from the screen. But in my experience, the uh, particularly meetings that I'm having where where usually, or in the past, people would be sitting around a table, uh, probably in some sort of clear hierarchy, or at least you know, the, the people with the most power have the most presence. What I found quite shocking is that on a Zoom screen, you're suddenly in quite an intimate relationship with people you used to be able to keep at a distance. It's like a new, a new uh, sensibility has, has arisen. Um, people can't hide themselves so easily. They're in their homes. You can see much more about them, the context they live in. But it's mostly the fact that their their face is right up close on screen. There's something quite intimate going on in a new way that I hadn't expected. So I come off a Zoom call feeling quite exhausted by the depth of exchange that's happened uh, uh, on a screen. And that surprised me. So I wouldn't say myself that we've gone backwards. I would say we've opened up. It's like opening up a number of new screens. Authority is uh, shifting, but there's a new quality as well on offer that wasn't there before. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I could definitely resonate with so much of mm. that. Um, but to make this not just a conversation between you and I, mm. I'm going to go back to some more questions. Sure. <laughs> um, so, so, uh, yeah, um, I'm I'm really interested in in what's happening in the new era of digital connection and what that's also allowing. And, and Nick came in with a question um, saying that your point on the existing dreams, um, you know, these existing dreams are very deeply embedded. Do you think we can switch from them momentarily, i.e. in months or years? Or do we need to appreciate this is most likely to take years or decades 
to make new dreams just as prevalent. And I was quite interested when, when Nick asked this, because I, I, this is a great question to you. And I'm also interested in what the, the pandemic has done to make things that seemed virtually impossible before now um, actually um, real in the everyday. Um, and also I was thinking from like a, from the conversation we had a couple of months back about, you know, people are experiencing systems system change for actually one of the first times in real life you can understand the knock-on effect of a pandemic which is like a great way for all of us who've been trying to work on that stuff in theory to actually say this is what you know this is how systems operate you know this is how one thing affects another so you know um what do you think about Nick's question is yeah. this something we can switch from quite momentarily it can happen quickly or is it going to take a, a long time huge question and i'll try and take it in bits but um nick you know what we're always saying is that we've been in this revolution for 20 years right so it's it's already been 20 years since we moved from this very narrow idea of the of uh, our experience of the world into the world of the internet and we've been flooded with information about other people and how they're thinking and feeling um, and I, what I've noticed is that we've been definitely progressing throughout this 20 years in our ability to notice and manage narrative and storytelling. Um, so we've been, we've been building the capacity over all this time to not only see that other people are telling us stories or presenting themselves in certain ways, but that we ourselves are doing that. You know, we've got our own online persona, for example. We've got our own ability to manipulate people's views on us. Where, you know, we've been building our capacity for um, observing uh, dream making in the process. So, for example, the idea of fake news. Well, fake news is not a new phenomenon. You know, fake propaganda is fake news. We've always been subject to fake news, you know. Uh, from 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 the moment we're born, our parents are telling us stories about the realities they want us to buy into, right? But it's been getting much steeper. The learning curve has been getting much steeper. And I would say there's a huge capacity already in the internet, implicit in things like Facebook or Instagram, for us to be able to manage our our sense of what is real and what's not. So let's let's build on that. Uh, secondly, the thing that I would really, uh, that I was trying to emphasize towards the end, and I perhaps didn't do a slide on it, was the importance of us owning our own uh, dreamscape or our own ability to manage this world. And I would, you know, draw attention to practices like meditation or mindfulness, where one comes back to oneself and notices the way we're thinking. You know, I notice how I'm thinking. I notice what is a dream. Um, so yes, I would say all this time we've been we've been moving much better into building this capacity. And then in terms, uh, Imi, of the pandemic, I want to I want to take us back to that very first story that I told, which may have been a bit confusing, and maybe I was trying to confuse right at the beginning um, about Jung's scarab beetle. Um, where does uh, the idea that life is a dream begin and end, right? So we, what we've been doing over this uh, period of time is we've been accessing the dream that we could, for example, solve the climate crisis. We've seen evidence of it, right? But we, we're, we're rapidly being pulled back into the business as usual where there's not much we can do about it and we'll be harnessed in the direction of the growth economy that's destroying our planet very quickly. If we can watch both of those things occurring at the same time, you know, to be um, ambitious about making dreams reality um, is still a leap of the imagination for most of us, right? It's, it's, it's really coming out of our own dream world and realizing that there's practical, real decisions we're making every day that go in the direction of one thing or another. So it's coming out of the dream world, you know, off what I call off the map and into the territory and waking yourself up to minute by minute what it is that you're doing that buys into one dream or buys into the other. So every time you're buying something you don't need or consuming something that's just a lie, you're kind of buying into that 
old dream. And if you if you're waking up to something and having a new behavior, you're buying into the new dream, right? If every, you know, if we could be doing this really en masse, if we could all be waking up and not buying into the old dream anymore with our actual behavior in real time on the ground, we would quickly reveal these, uh, these new dreams as being reality. They would become our reality. So that's 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 the sort of space we're trying to create in the in the alternative, and which I think obviously they're do, you're doing very much at Civic Square as well. Yeah, I'm 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 fascinated by this, Indra, because um, you know how much is of being able to manifest that into your life and start living it, which you know many of us on this call and who have accessed and found this festival. Um, you know, unless you've been recommended by someone else, you would have you would have known how to come into this and access it. And I'm sure there's so many people actively trying to change their um, choices and their behaviour and live their dreams today in in the way we purchase, in the way we live. But how much how much of that is function of privilege? How much of it is a choice? What do, what do we need to do in order for? So Rob earlier talked about you know the what it take. Rob, Rob um, Hopkins talked about what you need in order to be able to to imagine and unleash that creativity and imagination. What what's your thoughts on this? You know, how easy is it to opt in um, and into living this dream, and how much is it a function of a of a a, diff a privilege? And what does our precarious, racist society, you know, like how how does this actually play out in reality? At a, mm. at a, a scale that would topple things over. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this is the ongoing experiment, right? I mean, if I was to say convincing to you, oh, yeah, it's achievable, uh, that would still be coming from me and I'd have you in a you know, temporary trance, right? It's the ongoing experiment and whether or not we're willing to step into it. So, you know, Transition Town's a great example, you know, you know, and Rob, Rob and, uh, and, and the other people who are part of that uh, ongoing experiment are people who have stepped into that possibility and said we're doing it here right and not really in a sense to uh, be overly constrained by what is possible and not possible but simply to step into it and say we're materializing it here in this city at this time right so that's just, that's that's as much to do with um, the, you know the idea of what diet you would take or what kind of transport you would use or, you know, or working with others uh, in your community to be able to agree, you know, to share resources in ways that you haven't shared them before because you're getting practical now. So it's not a story. And I would say it's a deliberately moving on from a story of we are powerless, moving into a story of we can, uh, we can, uh, act as if, begin this process, uh, you know, walk in to make this dream of ours, right? Um, whether or not and how that replicates, uh, you know, uh, across the world so that we end up having a new global system, um, there's a science of that as well. You know, if you think about uh, the, uh, fr the fractal um, reality of things that think that, you know, patterns of change can replicate across the world very fast. But it's uh, maybe difficult for us to uh, understand that if we haven't experienced it. There's so much that we can't really um, say we know, but we can sort of put our faith into that way of uh, operating and commit ourselves. So th that's what I would say. I can't make any promises. You know, I can't say for sure. But I would say the science is available, the practice is available, and the experience for you personally is available um, on the level with the people that you're living with. That's, um, yeah, really, really fascinating. I'll, I'll um, come back to that in a second when we when we start to wrap up. Um, there, I don't think we're going to have time to answer this question, so I'm just going to share it because I think it will be great for you to ponder on and um, maybe jump in the chat or connect with Kate, who, who I actually have met recently and think, or maybe you already know her, but Kate Genevieve is doing some some great um, social dreaming stuff in the festival. But she was talking about um, 
how she's wondering how groups that are working to imagine and embody better futures look at supporting each other in the shadow work with more awareness. I, I actually have to admit, I don't know what the shadow work is. So if you can shine a light on that, that'd be great. But um, what I was going to say to this is that um, there's something about what you've said, and we've talked about it quite often, um, and you've put language to it again today about waking up from the dream, because um, one of the things that I've definitely learned over the last year or two from a, a number of different people, including yourself and others that I've been working with, such as Fazana Khan from Healing Justice London, who's also doing a session in the festival, is really about embodied knowledge and actually so much of um, of what we need is within us. And so much, particularly in communities of colour, uh, we've organised like this for many, many decades and centuries. And actually, we need to wake up out of the trance that has got us on this this grind within this system. So if you can, before we start to wrap up, if you can just speak to that a little bit in terms of, you know, what, what do what do groups working to imagine and embody better futures? And what do you feel about that that idea of embodied knowledge and and um, you know how do how do we support each other and unlock this more? Yeah, I mean, I think what the one of the reasons I wanted to 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 give some uh, focus to the idea of the of the brain and its many capacities is to draw a relationship between embodied and imagined. So um, I don't think either of them. Uh, you know, our 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 final destination, right? So, what is material in relationship to what is immaterial? To me, somehow conjures up the whole of reality, rather than either one of those things. If anything, I would say that the politics that I've been uh, invested in in the past was overly material. This idea that that really all we need is a roof and food and so on, um, in order to be able then give rise to our flourishing selves, not true. You know, we need the context, the conditions in which we can use our dreaming brains and imaginations to create better conditions for things much more than that, it's for us to become whole human beings. So going back to the shadow and the and the light, you know, I, I, for me, the if we look at it as the yin yang, that black and white symbol, um, the shadow is always something we can delve into. But I really want to propose that the shadow is as valuable as the light because um, it's really where our private selves have been uh, telling a different story about what is possible. It's a much more intense, um, it's absolutely complex, sometimes troubled, but, um, but, but very rich soil, if you like for what comes out into the light and the, the relationship between the dark and the light, between our shadow self and our performative self, uh, it's the relationship between those two things that are so very important as opposed to one trying to escape from the other or trying to uh, correct or improve or, you know, or in a sense, even process the other. Uh, they, are, they are in constant relationships. So that if anything, uh, I, I, I hope that this 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 talk, which may, you know, m m may seem itself a little bit dreamlike, um, would would make us um, consider always um, that there is a moving out of dream into material, and then from the material back into the dream. That we should keep those two things alive all the time, and that it should be as fluid as we can make it, um, and that it should be playful, you know, rather than exhausting. Um, that would be my ideal of the like the soil from which uh, a new kind of uh, idea of democracy and politics should arise. Thanks, Indra. And actually, um, I was going to uh, maybe bring this question later on in, and connect with Victoria directly because I thought um, I didn't want to just add it on to the end of this talk. But I've just, as you mentioned, that point about it shouldn't be exhausting. Victoria's asked, um, I'm a black woman and I'm also thinking about the exhaustion that takes place as we wait for others to wake up to our dreams and realities while we do the work of dreaming with others how do we are we patient and hopeful and i think i'll, I'll split that into two to say um this is something i know zaz from our team has, has replied back victoria this is something that is a, a dialogue um within many communities we're proximate to but also within um the team and i certainly won't speak on behalf of the rap team members but to say there's there's a couple of black only spaces 
during the festival that I led um, around imagination and futures. Um, and we, we can definitely connect you to those because we really hear um, how exhausting it can be to consistently be waiting for people to wake up and having be, to be persuading your reality to others. Um, mm. And so, so on that point, um, definitely um, we can connect you with those sessions. But I think, you know, I, I, uh, Indra's other title, apart from co-initiator of the alternatives, is a is a psychosocial therapist as well. And so, you know, while we do, you know, while black people do the work of dreaming with others, how 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 are we patient and hopeful? Um, and you know, do you have any advice or tips or insight mm. on that, Indra? Well enough, I maybe I do. Um, we had a, an event last night uh, ourselves. Um, with uh, Sabra Williams. I don't know if you know Sabra, but she's a black activist from the US, used to live in the UK, and she's very prominent in the civil rights movement in America. And um, she she suggested something that really gave me energy, or I, I could see that she was getting energy from, um, which is that she um, she sort of turned the task around um, and invited uh, white people to uh, stop thinking about the hard work that they have to do or, or the difficulty of the work that has to be done um, and join in with the black people who've been doing it for so very long. So what's happening at the moment is this kind of um, sense that there's almost an impossible mountain to climb as a white person realizes the, their white privilege um, uh, and that they're going to have to do this all by themselves. <laughs> and it's like they, they can't even imagine. Uh, and Sabra was inviting us. Um, I don't, well, you know, I, I, I identify as brown myself, so it's quite a different <laughs> way of looking again at things. But she was inviting the, uh, the majority of people on the call to join her, you know, like join us not uh, you do this and we'll do this. You know, she was uh, moving past that for herself. She was moving past the um, the binary um, and inviting a bigger party, if you like, of people all trying to do this together. And I think that when, you know, when, when that's possible, um, it becomes something that we're energetically doing together um, and in which, you know, in many ways, it's the black people who are teaching the tools and the awareness and the strength that maybe a lot of the white people now feel they don't have. They don't know, they can't draw on us. There's no strength to draw on in this moment of great change. And Sabra was offering her strength to the white people who didn't really know what to do next. It was quite a, it was quite a shift of perspective. Um, and, and I don't know, uh, Victoria, if that makes any, any, any sense to you, but I can tell you from a psychotherapy point of view that exhaustion is a, is a state of mind. It's physical as well, but it can be flipped. You know, it's, it can, you know, you can suddenly see that something that was uh, a truck, you know, like a, a like a huge wall suddenly becomes, you know, just this great path forward. You know, you break the wall. Um, so uh, I don't know if that, uh, anyway, that was just something I was sharing from Sabra Williams. And um, if, you, if you go to our website over the next couple of days, you'll see that um, that event online, you'll be able to watch and see what you get from, from her, from her story. Thank you, uh, Indra. And, and while we're on that point of, you know, getting behind the black organizers who've been doing the work for, for many decades and for a long time, um, one of the things that we've been sharing all the way along, and you might have seen it at the beginning of the day, um, is uh, we've curated six local projects um, that are doing really deep foundational work in black futures, black imaginations, um, black dreaming, and um, they've all got crowdfunders and other like things. So if you're enjoying this festival and you like that it's free and you have all this amazing content, just jump onto that link and support one of those projects. I definitely um, agree with Indra on one key point about the work is being done behind there, it, 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 out there, and it's been being done for a long, long time, many decades. Black feminist theory is, you know, um, has, has paved the way for so much and being able to get behind those projects is a, is a really good place to start and 
um, maybe share and amplify those. So, so thank you for that, Indra. I'm not going to take any more um, questions because um, we're now up to the hour because we started a little bit late. So I'm going to invite Indra to just leave us with a sort of closing thought. Indra, as we go into um, the next few months and in our memory, we've got a, a picture of moments that were really great during the, lock, the initial lockdown and we could see glimmers and glimpses of the future. There was moments of deep trauma for, for many communities, um, grief, pain. And we're now in this weird in-between bit where we can go to the shops, but we can't properly see our families. Um, you know, as we go through the next months and we start to emerge into the next part of this, what is it that you really think is important for people to hold on to? Um, what do you want them to really take away from your talk? and to, to really lean in on as we go into the next few months um, and maybe years. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to you and um, I'll come back in a second to say thank you to the audience. So final words from India, please. Okay. So I invite you really to consider that this moment is new. You know, that um, what we've experienced together over these last few months, uh, something that's been experienced or invited as an experience all over the world right all over the world people have been have been invited to consider this pandemic and to take action in relationship to that pandemic and then to observe what's going on we've had the, the privacy to some extent those of us who've had a bit more time uh, on our hands have been able to watch what happens to those who haven't had the time. I think this is very, very important that in a sense, the people with the most privileged have been invited to observe all of those without privilege and to see the difference and to see the inequality and to see the suffering. It's almost as if they've been invited to take time off to watch that. It's quite something and that's been happening all over the world. So from that point of view, my invitation really is to accept that this is a moment and then to invite you to think about the thing that I said at the beginning, your story of yourself that you present to the world, the story of yourself that you're telling yourself, and then this eternal story, the bigger picture within which we're all operating and take time to curate for yourself a dream of what's possible and then to move into relationship with somebody that you don't know who lives in your community and to share that dream and compare notes and hear each other out. And when the two of you have done that to move into relationship with another two people into fours and build that dream from there and experience your own reality, you know, your own dream moving into a reality of your relationship with these people. That's my invitation. On the basis of that, we could build something that adds up to a new democracy where the agency of every single human being matters and is counted. But the first person who has to do that is you. Right? You have to acknowledge your own agency tell your own story and then acknowledge the agency of the next person and make that a viral thing. If even it shifts a little bit in this time, which I really believe it will, I think there will be repercussions all over the world. Wow. <laughs> that was a, a really beautiful um, finishing moment. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to just sit with that um, and just have a moment to think about what Indra just said to consider this moment and to take the time to curate a dream of what you think is possible and then move into relationship with just one other person to share that dream. I just want to say a huge thank you to Indra. Um, Indra knows this very well. Every interaction with her is, is always transformative and she'll always tell you things that are sometimes difficult to hear, but you need to unpack them in yourself. So we're really grateful for your time. Thank you, Imi, and um, I want to say all the things back straight back at you because it's really an extraordinary thing that you've pulled off here. 
the amount of uh, and the different stories that I'm hearing and seeing on this event. And I just want to thank you for Civic Square. Civic Square for us is a model of what a Citizens Action Network could be and could be a unit of the new politics of the future. So I hope that we continue to work with each other. Um, for anybody who wants to know more, obviously go to The Alternative, uh, www.thealternative.org.uk and become a co-creator of this future with us. We'd really like to see you starting your Citizens Action Networks wherever you are. Thanks very much for listening. I'd love to have met all of you, <laughs> maybe in the future. <laughs>